Howdy. Sorry, howdy y'all. I'm in the south. I need to remember to localize. Um, so yeah, I, I'd like to talk about CSS for the next hour. That's, that's pretty much what we're going to do, so let's do it. Because um, there's a lot of new CSS stuff that's happening. Uh, uh, Rachel was just talking about some of it. Uh, Jen will be talking about more of it in a little bit. But I want to talk about um, some, some ways that I've been using uh, this, these new CSS capabilities um, to make my job easier and hopefully uh, to show you ways that it can make your job easier. Um, and one of the most fundamental things I think that's new and awesome is feature queries, otherwise known as at supports. So uh, some of you may remember way back in the day um, when we were all writing, well, remember uh, uh, image rollovers that Dreamweaver spat out, the MM, that thing, right? Because we didn't have hover effects. Well, we didn't have hover styles. We had hover effects, but they were all done with DOM scripting, right? DHTML. Um, and what generally happened with those scripts is there would be a thing in it that would say something like, if you are in Netscape Navigator, here's some JavaScript, right? Browser sniffing is what we called it. Um, and that's why user agent string today, user agent strings today in browsers are completely useless. They all refer to each other because people would write scripts that said something like, if you're Netscape Navigator, here's a bunch of code. If you're Internet Explorer, here's a bunch of other code that does the same thing but has to be written differently. And that's all we're testing for. If you have Opera, we don't care. So then Opera changed their user agent string to say, no, Internet Explorer, promise because Opera could do all of the stuff that Internet Explorer could do, but the way these scripts were written, they never, it never ran, had a chance to run the code. And then you know, if you look at a user agent string today, it's like gecko slash Mozilla DHTML Safari slash WebKit Trident, like dude, no matter what browser you're looking at. Um, because all of the browsers, as they got more capable, still had people saying, I can't use my banking website. It just does, I can't log in. And when the uh, technical evangelists at those browser companies would go and look, they would discover it was because the banking site had written browser sniffing into their code, and you couldn't log in without it for some reason. So then we moved to feature testing in DOM scripting, where it would, instead of saying, you know, if user agent has Netscape in it, if, you know, you support this DOM method, then here's some code with that DOM method in it. Right? We don't care what browser you are. It could be some browser that wasn't even heard of at the time we wrote the code, but as long as you support you know, document dot, dot get element by ID, then here's some code that depends on document dot get element by ID. So that was feature detection, or feature sniffing instead of browser sniffing. Well, CSS has feature sniffing. CSS never actually did browser sniffing, although people asked a lot. Uh, over the years. But we have at supports where you can say something like, hey, if you support display grid, then here's a block of stuff. It's very, fit, very similar to media queries. Hey, if this is a screen medium and uh, it's, we're less than 30M uh, wide, then here's some styles to apply. In this case, it's if you support this thing, this combination of things, in fact, then here are some CSS that you can work with. Uh, it has to be a property and a value, always. If you haven't used uh, feature queries, I just want to make that point. You can't say at supports display. For this precise reason, uh, if you're testing for grid um, support, but you ask a browser if it supports the display property, it'll be like, I've heard of display. Oh, sure, even if it doesn't support grid. Um, and I actually... Uh, if you're going to do, for example, CSS uh, variables or feature uh, custom properties to call them by their, by their correct name, uh, Leah Veru is the first person I saw use this pattern, and I, and I really like it. Supports dash dash CSS variables. And then if so, great. Here's a bunch of stuff that, that relates to variables um, that uses uh, CSS variables. There is one thing you need to be aware of, though, which is that uh, both of your property, both the property and the value have to be valid. Like, you can't say clip path and then just fill in any old thing after clip path for the value. 
You can't say, you, you can't do at supports clip path yes. That's not gonna work. And it turns out you can't say, and this bit me so many times before I finally figured it out because I am slow, um, at supports clip path polygon with uh, at the empty parenthesis, not valid. The browser will, a browser that supports poly polygonal clip paths will never see the style inside that first uh, feature query. But in the second one it will because I gave a, at least one coordinate to that polygon value. Okay, so you have to at least say polygon zero, zero. That, so far as I can tell, the sort of the staring, shocked polygon uh, selector. Um, polygon, <laughs> um, that works. And the reason that I kept trying to do the first one, where I just said polygon with two parentheses and I was done, is because you can do that with circle. Circle with no values inside the parentheses is valid. So, right, you, you can say circle, and that's, that's fine. But if you say polygon, nope. You have to have the polygon some sort of valid coordinate. I mean, it doesn't have to be zero, zero. You could do 50% minus 5% if that's the first uh, coordinate in your, in your polygon. You could have the whole, literally do the, hey, if you support clip path polygon, 50% minus 5%, 105%, 50%, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, like just copy that whole thing up. You can totally do that. Uh, you don't have to, <laughs> but you can. Um, and the other thing to remember about at supports, which uh, it took me a while to sort of internalize, is that there's nothing about the specification or the implementations that says the thing you're testing for has to appear inside the block. Like I can say at supports background clip padding box. I don't have to use padding box as a value or even background clip as a property inside that block. All I've done is said, do you support this? You do? Awesome. Here are styles. All right. Now, I don't know why you would want to do something like test for padding box background clip support and then give, it a, give the browser a bunch of colors. But if there's a scenario where that makes sense, go for it. Um, it's probably better to test for color support, but you know, you do you. If it, like I say, if it makes sense in your, in your particular circumstance, what I have done on occasion is I've done things like this where I've said add supports background clip padding box. And then inside, like it says here, I have a bunch of CSS, I'm using background shorthands. I might not even do any background clipping, but my assumption or perhaps presumption, is that if, it supports, if a browser supports this, then it's going to support the other advanced uh, background stuff that I'm going to try to do, like background size. Okay. This is, a, I mean, I'll admit, this is a little bit fragile. It's a little bit dangerous because uh, push too far, if you're testing for something that's different than what you're supplying the browser, you could get into a situation where, sure, it supports that thing, but it doesn't support anything that you actually gave it. Uh, it seems, un I mean, it's unlikely, but it's always possible. So, the fact that you can, that, that you can, you don't have to have in your support, um, in, in your um, supports block, what you actually tested for can be useful. So this is um, part of uh, a site that I put up that has all of the files that were used to produce the figures in CSS, the definitive guide like 98% of them are HTML and CSS. Um, so if you, if you have a copy of CSS, the definitive guide, and you look at a figure, the, the, the odds are approximately 98% that you are literally looking at a browser capture from Firefox, um, occasionally Chrome. Um, the Firefox had better uh, capture tools, so I, I used it for most of it. Anyway, so I, I put all the files online, why not? Uh, and I have this, this is like what the chapter four list of figures looks like, where it's got the name of the, the, the number of the chapter and the title of the chapter is like sideways text. Cool, right? I just did it and it's just text. It's not even an image, it's not an SVG. It's literally just text that I changed the direction of and I didn't transform it either. What I actually did was I used writing mode. 
I'm not gonna get into writing mode in detail, but this is how I set things up, where I said, hey, do you support grid? Okay, great, here's some grid stuff. And also, along the way, hey, do you support this writing mode value? If so, awesome, then here's some other stuff that will not only turn the text sideways, but assign it to a place in the grid. Right, so I'm actually able to nest feature queries, which is really cool. I, I, I love this, right, where I can say, if you support grid, here's some basic stuff uh, that, for the grid layout. And then if you also support writing mode, then I've got some extra cool stuff for you to do which in that, in that inner supports block, like I say, not only does it assign the, a writing mode to the, the H3 and the H4 there, but it also has some, you know, you go to the, this element goes to this grid cell and this element goes to this grid cell. Now, you don't have to nest these if you don't want to. There's actually two ways to do this. These are functionally equivalent. Right, where you have at supports display grid and inside it you say at supports writing mode sideways LR. If you'd rather, you can do the at supports display grid and then as a separate block, hey, do you support grid and writing mode sideways LR? If so, great, here, here's stuff. So basically that second block at the bottom would have the same content as the nested block up top. Like I say, these are functionally equivalent. It's really down to which one makes more sense to you. If your brain the way that your brain works says that, yeah, I want all the blocks to be separate and I'm going to use logical operators to do the ands and the ors, great, do that. If nesting them is fine with you, then great, do that. I personally prefer nesting, but I acknowledge it's just completely a personal preference. I like to nest things. I don't know why. It's Russian nesting dolls as a kid, I guess. But whatever the reason, that's how I do it. But then I started to run into, uh, you know, situations where I was doing ORs, and I, had, I was doing an OR te test, and then I embedded uh, supports inside where I was using the nested block to override stuff in the outer block, and it started to get a little bit complicated. So this is why uh, I would recommend, especially if you're working in a team, pick an approach and stick with it, right? Whatever works best for, for the team. Um, if you're going to nest, nest. If you're not going to nest, uh, then don't. Um, but either way, like just pick an approach and stick with it, at least for a while. If eventually the team starts to complain that it's too constraining, that things would be better if you did it the other way, okay, then you can decide as a team to switch. But pick one um, would be my, my recommendation. And what's fun about this is that you can, I, I, you can combine feature queries with media queries, right? Like I can nest a media query inside of my feature query, and I can have a feature query nested inside the media query that I nested inside the feature query. Um, but this actually gets to an interesting question. How exactly should I be arranging this? Because I'm saying, here I'm saying outside, here's a feature query, and then inside of that I've got, I have one media query. I might have multiple media queries, but then inside of that media query, I have another feature query, and am I gonna have to like repeat that pattern for every media query? I could do it the other way around, where I put the media query outside, and then inside I have my blocks of feature queriness. Um, and really the question that, that I started to grapple with was which one is better? Right, we have these two alternatives, where the media can be outside of the supports, or the media can be inside the supports. Um, and I, I gave them these names um, because they were easily uh, turned into acronyms that were easy for me to remember. MOS and MISO, right? So you have the, if you put the media outside the support statements, that's the, the MOS pattern, where you might have a situation where at every media breakpoint you have the same pattern of uh, feature queries. But on the other hand, you might have a situation where you only really need the feature queries at certain media breakpoints. Right? Perhaps uh, above 90 characters, I don't need to use these same, uh, well, 90 CH is not really characters, but above 90 CH, I, need to, I don't need to do these feature queries, or I might have a different set of feature queries. And maybe there's a, at a max width of 30 CH, I have, I don't, again, don't need any supports queries or, or I need a different pattern. But then when we flip it around, I might end up 
doing, okay, well, I'm, every time I'm gonna do a feature query, I'll repeat the, the media breakpoints where they're needed. So I might have you know, six or seven things I'm doing feature queries on, and maybe they all have the same uh, media um, queries, or maybe they, they have different sets of media queries. But again, I just kept asking myself, which one is better? And like everything else in our profession, the answer is, it depends. And this is sort of what I've come to. There may be more here. This is, this is like beginning of, the beginning of my thinking, but if I'm not doing very much feature query testing, but uh, I'm doing a lot of uh, media breakpoints, then uh, I, probably, I want, probably want the media uh, outside the support statements. Um, and especially if the support blocks are uh, not nested themselves, if they tend to be simple and flat, then the, the MOS pattern makes more sense to me. But if I'm doing a lot of feature detection for some reason, uh, and I don't have that many uh, media breakpoints, then the MISO pattern makes more sense. Um, especially if you, if you only have a few responsive breakpoints, um, which is possible but it depends on your design. So that's just a couple of things to think about uh, when, it, when it comes to supports. I, the fact that CSS has its own native feature detection just really jazzes me. Um, I love that it's just baked in um, because it makes it so much easier to do progressive enhancement. Um, where you can, you know, there's, there's this whole concept of, well, you do the basic styles and then you add more advanced styles and browsers that don't understand them will ignore them. But of course, we're always a little bit paranoid about the, 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 that idea that maybe uh, a browser will only half implement something and so it will, it'll break what we did. I mean, that's much less likely now than it used to be, but you can do, you can do the sort of thing where you say, okay, great, uh, I'm gonna test for support for this. Now, you are relying on the browser's honesty. Totally true. If, uh, if the browser implementer said, absolutely, I support this new thing, and they did a bad job of it, then uh, you're, you're stuck with, with the bad job of it. In fact, uh, there'll be an example of that later in the talk uh, with another display value. But for the most part, where I find it really useful is um, where I actually use test for display grid support, not to put all of the grid stuff in it, but to put in the um, margins and padding that I want to use in a grid layout scenario. So that's actually a situation where the thing I test for d actually doesn't appear inside the block because maybe I have certain uh, margins and paddings for various elements if they're gonna be in a linear layout, basically at mobile size let's say, and then, hey, do you support grid? Okay, great. In that case, I need you to like, get rid of the margin that I put around headings, because that will, like, that will mess up what I'm doing in the grid. So it's, it serves as a, as a useful bridge between now and what's coming. And one of the things that I've been working with a lot, and I'm, I suspect many of you have as well, is Flexbox. Uh, Flexbox is uh, incredibly well supported. This is a thing that I say, and people generally don't believe me. Flexbox has wider browser support than rounded corners. Border radius has, is not as well supported as Flexbox. And generally when I say that, people are like, that cannot possibly be true. You know why it's true? Because Opera Mini supports Flexbox, but not border radius. <laughs> anyway. Um, it's like 98%, 95, 90, I don't even remember what the percentage is, it's stupid high. Um, support for Flexbox. And I find Flexbox really useful. And I use it, in, I've been using it in places where you might not otherwise think to use it. Um, for example, here's this uh, speaker page layout. I use Flexbox for the social media icons at the bottom of the picture. Uh, and not to put them at the bottom, that's actually a negative top margin that's pulling it up, literally to center them. And I'm sure some of you are thinking, but Eric, text align is still a thing, and that's inline content, and text align applies to inline content. That's true. But I found it useful for, for a few reasons. Because as you can see here, Jen, has, has, we only have a few social media uh, links for her. Um, Rachel's page, uh, the, the 
image size is a little different, um, you know, and there are some more icons. And then you have pages like this jack wagon who's got a, like a million <laughs> social media links, whatever is going on with that guy. But so here's the question though. Well, let me, I'll get to the question in a second. If you look at this, this picture is a close in a figure, basically, or, or a div, which is floated to the right. And it has a negative right margin to pull it out a little bit so that it's hanging off because that's hip. But I'm floating a thing to float it. I'm not floating a thing to make it a column for layout. I'm using float for the purpose that it was intended when it was designed 20 years ago. And it's incredible. Oh, I get so jazzed about that because I'm not abusing float. I'm actually using it properly. Anyway, my point being, I floated this thing over to the side, right? This picture and the social media icons, and I have, you know, however many social media icons. Uh, but the, the uh, unordered list that contains the list items that contain the social media uh, icons there is set to display flex, justify content center, which makes sure that the thing is always centered. The question is, what happens if there's no picture? That happens. And I'm, I'm not happy with that. Um, but I realized that there was a solution here, right? So like I said, I'm floating the, so it's a figure with a class of basic inset. Um, it's floated to the right, it's got the margins, and then there's the, the speaker profiles, the UL has display flex, justify content center, and align item center. So here's one of the reasons that I'm using um, Flexbox here. Sure, I can justify the content center, but I can also align the content center, right? Like I can vertically center everything. So if, if a new social media uh, network really catches on and they happen to have this like narrow, tall icon for some reason, right? We'll, we'll call it palm, and it's a palm leaf. And I don't want to make it like super tiny, thin, uh, so I want to make it a little bit taller than the others so that it goes out a little bit. It will be vertically centered with all the others. Remember all those jokes about like the two hardest things in computer science for cache invalidation, naming things, um, and and uh, centering things in CSS, also off by one errors. Um, right? I've forgotten the, why those jokes are supposed to be funny. Literally, I have forgotten the vertical centering is supposed to be hard. So when I come across those, I'm like, wait, why? Oh, right, yeah. Used to, that used to be really difficult to do, but here it's really easy. OK, but back to my actual problem here, which is not that I have a taller social media icon. It's that I have this weird float, which I could leave like that. But I thought, you know, when we don't have a photo, we have a class. So all I really need to do is change the flex direction, and I'm done. The thing's floated to the side. But I've said, instead of having your flex direction be row, have it be column. And then they all go in a column over there in the, in the blank margin. And they're, they're centered. So if somehow the, the, the float gets taller than, than they are, like if I manage to stretch it so it's the page height, they will be vertically centered because of justify content center. And because now they're, now they're in column, the cross axis is the horizontal, they'll all be align item centered, so they'll all be horizontally centered with each other. Like centering just happens no matter which direction they go. And it, that's like, you might think, oh, so he showed us the, the bare minimum flex direction column. Well, yes, I did, but it's also the sum totality of what I added to make that happen. Right? I had all that stuff originally, and then I just said, hey, in this situation, make yourself a column. And I walked away smiling. Right? And then if we do have a picture, great. The, the class doesn't get applied, the no photo, and we go, and then so flex direction column doesn't apply, and we're back to this. And Flexbox is really useful if you're going to be in a situation where you might be internationalizing. So, you know, here I have tabs. Remember tabs? Remember when we designed tabs? Some of you might remember sliding doors even, but that's. For the rest of you, Google it. Slide, uh, list apart sliding doors. You get to see what we used to go through just to make this kind of thing happen. Anyway, so I've got uh, this nav set up. It's display flex. I justified the content to flex start, right? So it's over there on the, on the left, because we're, we're here in 
in English land, and, and there's some other stuff, obviously, I didn't show all of it. But what happens if this gets translated to Hebrew, right, which is a, or Arabic or any other right-to-left language? What do I need to do with justify content? I need to do that. I don't have to change anything because FlexStart is dependent on writing direction. And that's one of the really cool things about Flexbox right now that is going to become more and more of a thing in CSS is that there, our positioning, our, our you know, side to side kind of stuff is going to become more logical. But what, what I mean by that is things like we have margin left and margin right, yeah? Which means either a margin on the left or a margin on the right, regardless of the writing direction or anything else, regardless of whether or not this suddenly goes from being uh, left to right to top to bottom because it's been translated to, China, uh, to Japanese. But there are, we're, we're, we're coming to a point where there will be values like start instead of top. And there will be properties like margin block start. No, don't write that down because I, don't, I can't guarantee that that will be the property name. But that kind of idea where you say, this is the margin I want at the start of the writing direction. This is the margin that I want at the start of the cross-axis direction. This is the padding that I want at the end of the writing direction for this element. And this is a, just a first taste of that, where I said, you know, justify yourself to the start of this flex direction. And the flex direction is writing dependent. If this gets translated into uh, Japanese and, the, and it's decided that the tabs go down the side of the, of the layout, Justify content flex start means that it starts at the top and goes from there. It's the greatest. So at the top of an event of parts website, some of you may have seen, we have this thing with the logo and the nav bar. And this is how it's structured right now, where we have a body and a header that has a logo in it. And then there's all of the content. And then down near the footer, there's the navigation. and then we uh, absolutely position the navigation up on the top. This is a real, I mean, most of you have probably done this, a really common pattern for a really long time. The idea being for accessibility reasons that you wanted people to be able to get to the page content as soon as possible, and you didn't want them every time they hit a page to have to like listen to their speaking browser read out the nav bar for every single page. This is no longer a good pattern. We'll actually get to that in a second. But this is what we did for a long time. This is what I did on my personal site, right? You'd, take the nav from the bottom, and then you absolutely position it up into the top right or the top left or the whatever, which is great, um, except you can run into situations like this. Because with absolute positioning, an absolutely positioned element has no notion of where other things are, and the other, all the other things on the page have no notion that it's there. So this isn't really ideal. And it's also not a great markup pattern anymore. Because we have now things like nav role equals navigation. We have you know, ARIA roles um, where people who use assistive technology can, can be told by the technology that you know, this is a navigation element, and they can just skip right over it. Right? So we actually want now to put things up at the top. Uh, if the navigation is at the top, you put it at the top, and, and um, people have the option to, to skip it. So I'd much rather be doing this, and in fact, we will be doing this in, in not too uh, long a time, where I have a nav that has the logo, and it has all of the links, and then I just flexbox it. And it looks like this. And then uh, responsively, it does this. And there are no breakpoints in this, by the way. This is just happening automatically, including the text growing upward. Because in the nav, I said, you know, make yourself flex, Justify uh, the content to flex start. I'll get to that in a second. And then align the items to flex end, which in a right to left, top to bottom language, the uh, flex end of the cross axis is the bottom. That's why all the text on the nav links grows upwards as they run out of space. But I said justify content flex start. And clearly, the logo and the links are separated. And the reason they're separated is margin right auto. Because everything else in here has a margin of 0, the margin auto takes up whatever flexible space is left. You can really only do this once or twice in a given flex line, but you can do it. I'll use Firefox's Flexbox Inspector to, to make this hopefully a little more clear, that, that um, the crosshatch sort of thing that shows up to the right of the logo, that's the mar margin right on that logo. 
And because it's auto, it's just taking up whatever space there is. And if there isn't any space, then things start to squish down because they're flexible. They're flexible boxes. And a thing that it took me a while to internalize, actually, first it took me a while to realize, and then it took me a while to sort of have this be a, a, an instinct, is that anything I can do horizontally, I can do vertically. Fluxbox doesn't really care about the direction. So as an example, some of you may have seen this when you came to register for uh, the show. Um, this is for San Francisco, but it's the same kind of thing. We have these, these badges, right? You can click Buy Now and whatever, but if you look, all of those footers are all lined up with each other vertically, right? And it, no matter how long or short the descriptive text is, and if we uh, make that move, then that, that keeps happening, right? All of these uh, badges preserve the same height because they're all flex items in a, in a flex container that, that contains them all. And then each of the badges itself is a flex container that has a column-oriented uh, flex line. Okay, so how'd that happen? Let me zoom in on one of them. This is the markup inside one of these, pretty much. Inside the footer, there are a few extra elements, but at the top level, there's a time element for the date, there's an H2, there's a paragraph, and there's a footer. Okay, so I said display flex, direction column, time has no margin, H, uh, one, H2 has a top and bottom margins, the paragraph has a bottom margin, so that uh, if it's long enough that it's going to come up against the footer, I wanted it to have some extra space between the paragraph and the footer. And then the footer has some top padding, which is the purple there, and then margin top auto, because everything else has been, has been nailed down to an explicit value. That auto means that it will take up as much space. That blank there is where the magic happens. No matter how tall or short this badge gets, the footer will always be pinned against the bottom because it's forced there by margin top auto. That's enough of that. Right? So again, if I can do it this way, whatever I can do this way, however I can arrange things, however I can distribute them, however I can push them to one side or the other, I can do the same thing this way, or this way, if I do column reverse. And it, takes a little while to get used to that because that's completely alien to the sorts of capabilities we've had, right? It's, it's difficult to remember that that's a thing you can do. It's like, this is a thing and it exists and I can make it happen in more than 95% of the browsers in the world. Now, if you support a site that has a majority IE11 user base, this might not be as uh, relevant to you. IE11 does support, I believe, some Flexbox, but it's not super great because it's an older version of Flexbox. So you might not be able to get away with this. I haven't done, I admit, exhaustive testing in IE11. But if you're supporting you know, a large corporation where the IT staff has said that everyone will use IE11 because it's the safest and that's their rationale, and before anyone chuckles derisively, I can almost guarantee you there's somebody in this audience who lives in that world, not by choice, <laughs> necessarily, but they, that's what they have to deal with. I, yep, there's a, someone over here is like doing the, it's me, and there's probably other people in the audience who are like, I'm not gonna say anything, right? But, right, that, that exists. But it's still worth looking at doing these things because as an example, with those badges, like with a set of five badges. It's cool that I got everything to line up, but if they were all different heights, but they were, you know, they didn't look horrible, they were just different heights, so what, <laughs> right? Progressive enhancement. Um, yes, I understand that if the CEO doesn't like it, then so what becomes a, a problem, but, um, you know, you, you can still get away with a lot of these things. Anyway. Uh, that's, you know, getting used to this idea with Flexbox, that you have all these things that are sort of flexible and springy inside of boxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah? You see the metaphor here? Yeah, okay, good. Um, <laughs> then, uh, and, and, and start to play with things like, what happens if I put auto margins on the right and left of, of things? Um, what happens if I only have one auto margin? Uh, what happens if I use it to push this over here and that over there? Um, and what happens then if I try to do it vertically, right? 
play around with this stuff and, and, and find out how Flexbox really works. There are some surprising capabilities in there that the specification doesn't spell out necessarily unless you are super familiar with spec speak, which almost nobody is, and I get that. But um, like the specification doesn't say, and here's a cool thing you can do with auto margins. That's not what they're there for. If you want to go through the entire like Flexbox layout algorithm, which spans several pages, and by several I mean several dozen, go for it. I've been through that process. I do not envy you. Um, but for some people, that's their jam. Anyway, but moving on from Flex, now we're moving up to the world of Grid, which uh, Rachel was just talking about, which Jen is going to touch on. Um, I just, uh, as a show of hands, how many, have used, how many of you have played with Grid or used it in some fashion? It, doesn't, it can just be, I make, made a few test pages. Okay, how many of you have done it in production, like shipped a site? Okay, not as many hands. But that, I mean, that's good that some of you are doing that. That's awesome, because Grid is awesome. It's the best. Uh, it's another, th it's f basically since the beginning of CSS, or sorry, not since then, since the beginning of the period in which people, other than my wife, asked me what my opinion was on CSS, and they've asked questions like, what does CSS need? What is it missing? I have said, layout. It's a presentation language. It's not a layout language. That's no longer true. Grid makes it a layout language. Not, not a perfect layout language. There's more that can be added to it, but it is a layout language now, 20 years Finally, that layout-shaped hole at the heart of CSS has been filled. And this is a really good uh, article. The URL will come up in just a second here. Um, that was written earlier this year about uh, using grid at scale. And this is, when, when we say using grid at scale, what the author here means is that he used grid in production on a, a massively visited site that is central to, according to him, the industry in which the company works. There are a lot of great nuggets in here, but this one in particular I wanted to pull out, where he said, we, we used grid to like put things in the layout, but inside of those things that we put, placed in the layout, we used Flexbox to arrange what was in there, even if it didn't always make the complete sense, because the team needed that distinction. They needed to say, up here we're using grid, and down here we're using Flexbox, right? It helped, it, it kept them from getting confused because different people in the team will be at different levels of understanding of Flexbox versus Grid, right? And so if you just say, look, if you just said, use whatever, or use whatever seems best to you at the moment, then you might have somebody who implements this one component in Grid and someone else com implements a similar component in Flexbox, and they don't talk, right? Like, when you're working in a team, you need to draw these distinctions. And I think this is a good idea, even if I might draw the line somewhere else, a line was drawn, and I think that's valuable. And I think it's a good thing for you to consider, especially as the team gets up to speed on how you want to use these technologies. Right? Because you may, have a, you may have a project, your team may be working on a site where grid doesn't really help that much. I mean, it's still cool, and, it, and, and I'll, I'll show you reasons why you should still get to know it anyway, but it might be, you know, Something where you say, yeah, I mean, Grid is nice, but it, does, you know, it doesn't give us that much. Whereas Flexbox is great because of the, the X, the Y, and the Z that we use. Or it could be vice versa, right? Flexbox doesn't help us except in the nav bar across the top. But everything else, man, Grid, all the time, everywhere. That's for you to figure out. At any rate, I had a situation that I needed to fix. Those of you who are familiar with WordPress will be familiar with this inside the dashboard. It's the recently published. And there's something that always bugged me about this, which is this. See what's happening to those links where they wrap underneath the dates in the blank space? That's not right. That shouldn't happen. And for years, I just put up with it, because what else was I going to do? But then one day, I looked at this and I said, this is a grid. It's not much of a grid, but it's still a grid. I could do something about this. So I installed a little plugin to apply CSS to administrative area of the site. And so here's how this is structured. And you have to remember, this is, a, this is a situation where WordPress is generating this markup. I cannot change this markup, which is the situation that a lot of us face, which is 
something else generates the markup and we don't get to change it. Or we might get to change it a little, but we don't really, like we can't dictate that. So I have a situation where each of these recently published items is a list item that has a span, not a time element, and then a link, okay, and that's it. That's all I have to work with. And the way that it uh, pushes the links to the side is that it makes the span be inline block and gives it a minimum width of 150 pixels. That's how that works. Okay, so this is what I have to work with. I have a span, and I have an A, and I have a list item that contains them. I can work with this, I said to myself. So I did this, and this was the result. Basically, I said, hey, for list items, display grid, grid template columns, max content 1FR, grid gap of 0.5M. Uh, 0 so I, I'm putting a gap of half an M between grid cells. I don't have to define the margins on the span or the A to push them apart from each other. I just say, there's a gap between you. We're done here. And that's a gap between. It's not a gap around the outsides, right? So even, anyway. Um, and then I, for the span, I said min width auto, because I didn't want it to be 150 pixels. I wanted it to be whatever size it was going to be. I was like, yes, I have failed to do what I really wanted to do. I got close, but I'm not quite there. And some of you may have spotted the problem. For those of you who haven't, let me illustrate. Those don't line up. And once I saw it, I couldn't not see it. <laughs> because here's the problem. I didn't create one grid. I created five grids. Because each list item is its own grid. So each list item is a two-cell grid with one row, two columns. The first column is always, in this case, max content, like I said. So that's the maximum size of the content, uh, basically the maximum width of that date. And then the second column is whatever's left over. That's the 1FR. But the dates weren't always the same width. And I could have gone back to 150 pixels, but damn it, I was not going to. Right? There had to be a solution here. And there sort of is, except there isn't <laughs> yet. Um, what I finally came up with was I did set a, uh, an explicit width. I set it to 9M for the span, or for the, yeah, for the span, instead of 150 pixels, which was not really where I wanted to be. What I want to be able to do is say, hey, each of these list items is going to participate in a grid that they all share, so that I could go back to saying max content 1FR, and then that first column would be the width of whatever the widest date was. That's what I want, but I can't have it yet. Rachel talked about subgrid. There's also, you may have heard, there's a way to sort of fake subgrid, which is to use display contents. And that actually, in a supporting browser, which uh, in this particular case was Chrome when I took this animation, um, you get, basically you say, hey, the list items are display contents. And what that does from a CSS point of view is it makes all of the, in, in, the, in the rendering tree, it acts like the list items went away and their children got promoted to be children of their parents. So now the uh, span and the A in each of these list items are being treated as if they are children of the UL, not of the LIs. It's like the LIs went away. And this does exactly what I want. Here's the problem. And here's the reason why all, there's all that sort of monkey vomit green instead of the nice Christmas green that we like to see for support, is that uh, like I said, the list item is taken out of the rendering tree, but there's a bug in all of the browsers that have that terrible green, which is that that list item and all of its children are also removed from the accessibility tree. So for someone using assistive technology, those list items effectively don't exist if I'm using display contents. That's not acceptable. Can't, so display contents, really interesting, uh, could have uses beyond faking subgrid, but don't use it yet. Keep an eye on the support. And basically, uh, right now, it's, we're stuck at Chrome needs to implement a fix because the Edge team will not deploy display contents until Chrome is doing the right thing. It's a long story, and I'm not going to get into it. Um, Firefox, this is actually, this chart is slightly out of date. I should have updated this. Uh, six, Firefox 62 is out now, so they've fixed this accessibility bug. <clears throat> but Chrome so far has not. 
nor Safari or, or any others. Okay. <clears throat> so at a certain point, I was doing this with the ad supports and all that kind of stuff. Um, that, that, was a, that was a thing that worked as long as I didn't care about accessibility, which I do. So, you know, I put it here as an example of how display content should work. But again, don't use display contents until this is all fixed. Regardless, here's what I really wanted to do. And this isn't, if, if you downloaded your slides just before I started speaking, this won't be in your uh, slides. If you downloaded them last, like earlier today, this slide probably isn't here. Please delete it. Here's the reason. Right now, the idea is that you would say for the list item, you could say grid template column subgrid, grid, te grid template rows subgrid if you want to. And in this case, I wouldn't really need to, but I can say grid template column subgrid, which means it will look up to the nearest grid ancestor and use that grid for the t columns and the rows, which would give me exactly what I want. The reason that there's no support chart here and it's, it's not supposed to be in your slide deck is that I have, there's no guarantee that this will be the actual syntax or the way that this works. Okay? The working group's still working on it. They recognize the problem. They're working toward a solution. This may well be accurate in a year. Or it could be one of those things that if you pull it up to look at what you were doing last year, it's like, oh, yeah, remember when Eric thought that was how it was going to work? Yeah, that's not how that turned out. Right? I don't know. But that's, that's the idea is that this is how this would work if the current subgrid proposal moves forward. I think there will be some subgrid, like I say, uh, that like s grid level two is pretty much, the spec is literally, literally written as l all of grid level one. And now here's the thing on subgrid, right? That's, that's it, at least so far. Anyway, so subgrid hopefully soon. But I'm still using grid now. I'm using it in production. This is the footer on my personal website, uh, myrweb.com, where uh, basically, I used grid template areas to sketch out in text how this grid should be shaped, and then I just assigned different divs, I think they are, they might be sections, whatever, into these various areas. Right? For, the, for the one that says uh, other projects, it has um, you know, display proj, is, and it pfft, right there, right? And that's how those get laid out. And then the great thing is, uh, if I want to make it responsive, as this starts to pull out, I can actually change the grid template area, just the grid template areas, so that now things are you know, four across here. And then as it comes back in at a certain breakpoint, it goes to this template areas. So in fact, my footer is set for display grid, grid template areas like this, and a, I set up a grid gap. Um, where there's no vertical grid gap and there's an M and a half of horizontal grid gap. I believe that's how that works. Maybe it's the other way around. I can never remember. I always have to look that up. But anyway, and then at, once it gets narrow enough, it switches to, to that other grid template areas, the, specifically this one. And this is literally all I do at that breakpoint to change how the footer's laid out. I just redefine the template areas. Done. So I'm going to have to cycle through that again. But you get the idea, right? Which I find really useful. And if a browser doesn't support grid, then all of the, um, all of the sections of the footer are just going to be in source order. And I'm OK with that. Like, I can live with that. It's my personal site. I can get away with it. And then uh, it's been quite a few months now. But this is a design uh, that was sent to us by uh, Mike, our designer. Um, who was, he was noodling with ideas for ways to, to redo the homepage of an event apart. This is not what we ended up picking, by the way. Um, but this was one of the ideas he sent. And then, you know, I got the PDF, and I opened it up, and I said, this is grid. I know this. I could do this. So I immediately imported the PDF into, into Photoshop, and I started like drag selecting these, these, these rectangles, and then copying them, and pasting them into new documents and saving them out. And after a minute, I thought to myself, I've been here before, and I miss it. Just a moment of silence, please. Yeah. Oop. But this is what I ended up with. I got to go back one. Sorry. Uh, at the end of that, right, I had a bunch of images. 
And this is the markup that I use, like literally the markup that I had. You can even see where originally uh, I started cutting out the events first, and so I gave them all Xs, uh, pre prefixes, and then all the news were Y, and then all the heroes were Zs, because I, I don't know. <laughs> um, and then I started rearranging them in the source order because I was like, oh, yeah, actually, you know what? We probably, when it comes to the actual source order, we're gonna, I'm going to want the, the hero to be up front because then it, it, it's basically saying, you know, as Jeffrey's talking about, this is what we do, this is why you're here, hopefully. And then I want to say what the events are, and then I want to do some stuff about us, and then I want to do the latest news post, right? Like, that's eventually the, the source order I settled on. And this is the CSS I use to arrange those images. It's part of it, anyway. Um, where I literally said, I'm going to define some columns and some rows. I'm going to size them like so. I'm going to um, set up a grid gap of one CH, because why not? I don't you know. I want the images to be 100% by 100%, and I also want that to be their max width and max height, because I'm assigning these images directly into grid cells. So I want them to like, span the entire grid cell. And then if an image has a class of tall, it should span two grid columns, or two grid rows, excuse me. Uh, if it's wide, it should span two grid columns. If it's extra wide, it should span three grid columns. Okay? And then that last part will be repeated at the top of the, of the next slide. But this is where, uh, this is where I got to, including with some breakpoints, where I rearranged what went where based on you know, how narrow it was. And again, these are, these are just images, so you know, Jen gets kind of squished over there and take the next step when it, when it gets narrow enough. But I, I didn't care, right? I'm prototyping here. And then there's that span two, span two, span three again. And then I pretty much just said, I want the hero, first hero to go here, the hero image, the second hero image, which is Jen, to go in this place, the third hero image to go in this place, the sign up form to go in this place in the grid, and the rest of it can just automatically flow in. Wherever it goes, it goes. Because this is my grid. And so things just flow in. So here's an example of one of the breakpoints where I said, OK, at this breakpoint, I'm going to change this span, and I'm going to change that thingy over there. right? And it looks like this. And then I thought, you know what? Why don't I just redo this as text and background images? Because I could do that. And uh, so I did. I, I retyped all of the text because it came to me in a PDF and drag selecting and copying text properly out of a PDF, and then it was faster to retype it. So I did. Um, but I used the same structure. I just replaced those images with like divs or whatever. Um, I think they were divs. And then I put in text that was in H2s or H3s or uh, paragraphs or links or whatever they were. And I used uh, some, calc si some uh, calculation values for the font sizing so that the font size would scale up and down. So if you had a, like a huge monitor, the text will be bigger. And if you're, you know, tiny values, it'll be smaller. Um, I used some uh, mixed blend mode uh, to, to prototype some ideas as to how the, the text would, would look on the, on the background of, um, that was behind it, that sort of thing. You know, but we ended up with that. And I have to say, at this point, from the time that I got the PDF until the point that, that I had this uh, scalable text, it was about two and a half hours. I already had a working prototype in two and a half hours. And this grid code that I wrote might have never seen production. Right? Remember, I said we ended up not going in this direction. And in fact, part of the reason we ended up not going in this direction is that when I was at the end of that two and a half hours, right, right before lunch, I sent mail to the rest of the team, and you know, Mike and Jeffrey and, and everyone else, and said, hey, I." I just I worked this up. Let me see what you think. And Mike told me um, uh, a, a month or two later that that helped him see that that was the wrong design direction. We were not going to do that. Which you might think to yourself, oh man, Eric went to all that effort. It was two and a half hours. And, we, and already Mike knew that it was a mistake. Imagine how much time we would have wasted if we'd all convinced ourselves it was a good idea off the PDF, gotten most of the way through implementing it, and then realized it was the wrong direction. Now what? Do we keep going even though we think it's the wrong direction? Do we scrap it all and start over? I like to think that I saved us all a lot of time and heartache, right? Because I was able to, with Grid, rapidly prototype this, like really rapidly prototype it. I was surprised at how fast it went. 
right? And I was able to use grid inside of these little boxes as well. So this shows the lines just for the Seattle box. Actually, for any box that has special editions, so, but this only applies to Seattle. I just extended them infinitely. And this is how they're, they're specced, right? Inside, I said, you know, display grid, grid template rows, and then I named them all. Rachel was talking about naming grid lines, right? I said, okay, the first grid line is called city, which is that top one right across the top of the Seattle box. I named it city. And then I said 50% track size, which means it'll be half the height of that box, however tall or short that box gets. And then the next one is special ed for special edition, min content, uh, so that it'll be as tall as the content, and then a half M for that, that little separator between special edition and full schedule available. That's a half M grid row. Then full sched for the full schedule, 1.5 M for that, 2 FR for that separator, and then dates, the, the line right above the date there is dates. That's another 1.5 M and then 1 FR below it. So again, as things, uh, if this uh, got taller or shorter, the separation between full schedule available in April 2 through 4, 2018 would be twice the height of the space underneath April 2 through 4, 2018, because 2 FR, 1 FR, that gets 2 and 1, there, like that, right? And then down there, you can see, I said grid row city, grid row special ed, grid row full sched, grid row dates. So that if I decided I wanted the date to be on top, I could literally just rename the grid line names in grid template rows up there and not ever change anything about the last, that, the second block of CSS. I could just rearrange things really quickly. All I had to do was, uh, was edit the template, not the assignments, right? That's part of what makes this so fast. Once you've like come up with good labels and said this is going here and this is going there, all you gotta do is edit the template. Okay, and then this is how things turned out in, in a situation where um, there wasn't a special edition. And I could look at this and I could say to myself, okay, so I like how full schedule available lines up with the special edition boxes for, a, for an event that's not special edition, but what's going on with the date there? It doesn't line up with the other ones. I probably, I'm probably going to have to do something about that. It took me 30 seconds to figure this out, right? To figure out that there was a problem. I didn't actually ever get around to fixing it because it was around this time, I think, that I got the email from Mike saying, yeah, let's not do that. Um, and I could also use things like events, like hover events, to try different things, right? So for events, I have this template rows, but then if the body gets hovered over, an event has this different template. So literally, all I have to do is move the mouse cursor into the browser window to have it change the order of the content in these boxes, and then move it out to switch it back. And like, do I like this one, or do I like that one? This one? or that one, this one, or that one. And I could have sent it to the rest of the team and said, hey, what do you think, right? There's a difference here. The date is always right underneath the city in one, but it's always near the bottom at the other. And the special edition is in a different place as with regards to the dates, right? Because I just edited the templates. So great. <laughs> it felt so good. And then uh, this is something that I was doing to, for, the, uh, for the cities there. Remember that first grid row is 50% tall. It's half the height of the box. And originally, I said, okay, well, there's an H3 I'm putting there, and I'm going to make it flex, and I'm going to have it be the, I'm going to line the items to the flex end, and blah, 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 blah. And then I thought, wait a minute. I don't have to do all that. It's an H3 that I'm putting into a grid. I could change it so that it has margin top auto, and I don't have to make it a flex, and the magic will happen, just like it did with Flexbox. It'll push it down so that the text Chicago is right there above that 50% point that I want, and the same for all of the other cities. Right, so rather than turning this H3 into a flex thing, I could just let it be an H3 and say, your top margin is auto. Awesome, and it got pushed to the bottom. And so I had this, right? I have this fully responsive thing that I, this prototype, that I had created in a morning. And I didn't go through all of the little pieces of it because unfortunately I didn't really have time, but um, you know, you can, the core of it, you can, you can see here where like, see how the dates are not lining up vertically because I didn't, I didn't actually ever get around to fixing that part. But again, before lunch, I had something I could show people. And it was, you know, full selectable text and the text scaled up and down thanks to the calcs. 
it was like a superpower, right? Grid is amazing for this. Even if you're not ready to, to deploy Grid in production, even if your user base says, you know what, they don't have Grid, you can still use it today. You both, and it has two advantages. One is you start to get used to it so that when you're ready to deploy Grid um, in production, you're, you're set, right? You've already had practice with it. But the other, th the other reason is that you can be so much more productive with it, right? Some of you may have seen this over the years, right? The, what my friends think I do, and then down at the bottom, what I think I do, and then what I actually do. Anyone remember that support table right there? That was, that was a transitory period. And yeah, for a long time, this is kind of how it felt. But to me, this is how it feels now. I'm not kidding. And honestly, I have to change that, that, that middle bottom uh, now Right, because that's what I keep hearing. Have you checked the support tables? No, Brad, no, I haven't. And I'm not going to, because I'm prototyping here. I'm using this for rapid prototyping so we can figure out if this is gonna work or not. So I can, we can look at it at breakpoints and say, is this trash, is it pretty garbage, or is it serving a need, right? Is it doing what we need it to do? And then maybe I'll deploy that, maybe I won't. It'll, it'll depend on, on where, what, we, uh, what we figure out down the road. But it really is like having godlike wizard powers. It's uh, really what it feels like uh, in, a, in a way that uh, I had started to think might not ever actually happen with CSS, right? There was a long period of time where it felt like we're always gonna be kludging stuff together because this is what we have. And you know, we might get, we get custom web fonts and that's awesome, but I'm still floating things and hoping that that doesn't all fall down. And now there's an actual robust layout system, and it's pretty amazing. You can do awesome things with it, and I hope that I've given you some motivation to go out and try out the, the, the stuff that I talked about and make awesomeness. Thank you very much. <laughs>